Hi, welcome to another episode of For the Love of You. We're so excited that you could join us today. We're so um, pleased that we can have Dr. Montague here once again with us. Today we're going to talk about cardiovascular disease. And Dr. Montague um, has been in Omaha since 2004. He's family practice in emergency medicine for Charles Drew and also um, medical director um, for Charles Drew. And so thank you for coming. Um, we're so happy to have you. Well, thank you, thank you. And just one for clarification, I was the previous medical director for Charles Drew. Uh, Dr. Uh, William Ostick is the current medical director, and he's doing a wonderful job over there. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so today we're going to talk about cardiovascular. So can you just start <coughs> off the community and describe what is cardiovascular? Some people might not even know what that is. All right. Well, I think it, it's a very important topic because cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular death is the number one cause of death in the United States, accounting for more than 23% of deaths. And that's, more than all, uh, that's more than cancer uh, causes. And cardiovascular is, is just how it sounds, cardio meaning the heart and vascular meaning the vascular system. And to tell you how important it is, your uh, body consists of over 100,000 miles of blood vessels, meaning your capillaries, your arteries, your veins, 100,000 miles that blood pumps through every day. And on average, the heart pumps about 110,000 times every day. Wow. So you know, we, we get excited if we get 2,000 steps in, but your heart is doing, uh, taking 110,000 beats every day. So with that, what are some risk factors of cardiovascular disease? Uh, I like to refer to what I call the sickening six. There are six major factors that are responsible for causing cardiovascular health. The first three many people are familiar with, being high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. But many people don't know that there are another three that are top causes, and that is smoking, lack of exercise, and persistent high levels of stress. With the high levels of stress, what mm. might cause those? Um, a lot of times we refer to what we call uh, type A personalities. Uh, so we have a class of people, an increasing number of uh, Americans um, are always trying to be in control of everything. And so um, having tight schedules um, that can be um, working uh, numerous uh, extra hours at work or even having very hectic um, work-life balance. Um, if you find yourself being stressed about uh, how you're going to get your kids from one activity to another each and every day, um, and also financial stress, um, it can be another factor. But when you find yourself under high levels of stress and on a persistent basis, I'd say if you, find, if you feel that you're stressed out more than two to three times a week, and then you're a prime candidate for being at risk for cardiovascular disease. What are some ways I can decrease my risk factors? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of people are under the false impression that it takes having uh, a gym membership, um, that it takes uh, putting in two to three hours of, of heavy duty exercise every day. But the truth is that it only takes 30 minutes a day of cardiovascular exercise, and that is only needed three to five times a week. Um, doing 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, which is described as continuous, nonstop, getting your heart rate uh, preferably uh, above 80 to 100 um, or more for continuously for 30 minutes has been shown to decrease your risk of cardiovascular death by up to 50 percent. And there's an even added bonus to making this easy. 30 minutes doesn't have to be all at one time. Really? Yes. You can split it into three 10-minute increments. As long as it adds up to 30 minutes in a 24-hour time period, it still gets there. But it does have to be at least 10 minutes worth. Okay. But that means that you could park your car further away uh, when you're walking to the office and do 10-minute walk uh, to the office, 10 minutes on your lunch break, and 10 minutes on your way back to your car at the end of the day and you're done. Or you could do 10 minutes uh, during uh, commercial time or even during your favorite television show. Uh, but really, three 10-minute increments, three to five times a week, is all that it takes to decrease your risk by 50%. Wow, that's a lot. Yes. So you said diabetes is also a risk factor. What are mm -hmm. some ways that if I am precursed with diabetes, um, mm -hmm. are some ways I can maybe decrease the risk for cardiovascular if I have diabetes? Well, let's say that you're one of the millions of Americans that have pre-diabetes, meaning that your blood sugar levels are high, but they're not high enough to cause diabetes. But it's shown that if you don't have any uh, changes made in your lifestyle or diet, and that you would likely develop diabetes within three to five years. If you're someone in that category, there is a wonderful program called the Diabetes Prevention Program. 
and this is a nationwide program that you can um, access in all 50 states. And it's been shown to decrease the progression from prediabetes to diabetes by over 85%. So that means only 15% of people that complete the program that are at risk for diabetes actually will go on to develop diabetes within the next five to 10 years. Wow. Uh, so that's a great uh, risk reduction for people that haven't crossed the barrier for being diagnosed with diabetes. For those that do have diabetes, it's important to know that diabetes is not a death sentence. And just because you may have a family member or multiple family members or friends that have gone on dialysis or lost a limb for complications from diabetes, it doesn't mean that it has to happen to you. It's very important to get regular medical care, seeing your doctor on average about once every three months, as long as your blood sugars are under good control. But you do have to take your medication and follow a consistent diet. What kind of diet do you recommend? Right. Diet is not a bad word. Some of my <laughs> friends treat it like it's a four letter cuss word. Sure. Right? <laughs> but diet literally just means what you regularly eat. It does not mean that you have to go on uh, the keto diet, a plant-based diet, intermittent fasting, severe uh, calorie restrictions. Many of these are fads that come in and out of fashion. But diet literally means creating a consistent way of eating. Um, and you can, especially if you're at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, it's a good idea to meet with a nutritionist who can help you formulate a healthy diet that tastes good. Because no matter how healthy it is, if it doesn't taste good to you, you're not going to stick to it. So finding good tasting, healthy choices is what I consider a, to me, any diet is the one, any good diet is the one that you're going to stick with. Okay, perfect. You mentioned high blood pressure. So mm -hmm. what is a good blood pressure that we should shoot for? Um, I know American Heart had just lowered it recently. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. So oh, technically, they didn't really lower it because it just went back to what it was when I, I first uh, started studying medicine. Okay. Um, back in the uh, 90s, early 2000s, uh, normal blood pressure was defined as anything 120s over 80s are, are better. Um, and gradually that rose to 130s, even to, to uh, 140 at one point. And we've realized with using evidence-based medicine that that 120 over 80s level is actually where it should have uh, been the entire time. So a normal blood pressure is defined as anything in the 120s uh, over 80s. Um, and then uh, being at risk for high blood pressure is when you get to the 130s and you're definitely at higher risk for heart disease once your uh, top number, the systolic number, gets above 140 or the bottom number, known as your systolic, I'm sorry, your diastolic, gets above 90. Uh, so again, the goal is 120s. Anything above that uh, for the top number, you want to make sure that you're doing some of the things that we talked about, diet, exercise, meeting with your uh, doctor to see if there's medication that could help lower it as well. How do you know if you have higher blood pressure without getting it checked? Um, I also refer to diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol as the silent killers because you can have these diseases for 10, even 20 years without knowing it. The symptoms can be very vague, headache, blurred vision, increased thirst, just not feeling well. Um, so it can be very vague if you're not getting regular checkups, which should be at a minimum once every 12 months. And then you could have one of these conditions that are slowly killing you from the inside. And you may not know it until you have a massive heart attack. Um, and it's too late to reverse some of that damage. Um, most of us would never dream of not getting our car checkup at least uh, a couple times a year. But our body is the, is the most expensive machine that we have and yet we'll neglect getting that checked up just once a year. Sure. So do you recommend at least seeing your physician once a year? I recommend at least once a year, even if everything is fine. Okay. Um, it's just a pit stop. Sure. You come in, you get your height, your weight checked, you get your blood pressure checked, you'll get some simple blood tests drawn to make sure that everything is working properly. And if everything checks out fine, you're good for another 12 months. Wonderful. What are some other signs and symptoms of cardiovascular disease that besides the massive heart attack or um, extreme headaches, blurred vision, those kind of things that the audience should maybe watch for? Um, well, for our, our male viewers out there, um, I always stress to them that the heart is connected to a very important uh, part of your body that you value very highly, your penis. Okay. Uh, in order for a male to get an erection, the heart has to pump blood into the penis. If there's anything that's decreasing blood flow that's blocking it, which uh, that is the definition of cardiovascular disease, um, it inhibits blood flow, 
Um, but if it's inhibiting blood flow to the heart, it usually is also going to be inhibiting blood flow to your penis. So decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease means you also decrease your risk for erectile dysfunction. Um, and it's a popular misconception that uh, medicines like Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra will work regardless of the cause of erectile dysfunction, but that's not true. Uh, while it helps with uh, people that are suffering from cardiovascular disease, it is an expensive medication that does have some side effects, and simply making changes in your diet, your exercise level, and your stress level can give you just as much benefit, if not more, than a tablet of Viagra. Really? That's interesting. Thank you. Um, what are also maybe some different signs and symptoms for women versus men? For women, it's very important to minimize risk factors, even more so than men. And I say that because women have a higher chance of presenting with atypical symptoms. Most people know that if they get chest pain, especially if it's going down the left side of their arm or if it's associated with neck or jaw pain, that they should get to the hospital immediately. However, women have a higher incidence of presenting with atypical symptoms. They may have right-sided chest pain. They may have back pain. They may have uh, neck pain or just atypical symptoms. And many women will also present um, asymptomatically, finding out when they're coming to the hospital for a different reason that they've actually had a, a small heart attack before. Uh, so because of that fact that women don't typically present with the classic symptoms that uh, society knows to look for, it's even more important that they get in for their yearly checkups. Wonderful. So we kind of talked about blood pressure and diabetes. Um, once your blood pressure is above like 140, mm -hmm. um, diet, exercise, we've done all those measures. Still our blood pressure is not getting down to that 120. What are some options for us then? Well, one, let's say that we actually look to start making interventions when your blood pressure gets into that 130 group. And definitely at 140, we should be even getting more aggressive. Um, but if you're taking, uh, did you say if you're taking medication? No, we, that's or. kind of what I was leading to. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> the first thing, the first step uh, really should always be looking at your risk factors. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, there is uh, one risk factor that I, I did not mention was uh, cigarette smoking. Um, it's significantly associated with elevating your, your blood pressure. So I talked about the sickening six, but only mentioned five. <laughs> cigarette smoking would be number six. Um, but de uh, eliminating cigarette smoking, uh, getting on a regular um, exercise program, again, uh, 30 minutes, it can be three 10 minute uh, segments, uh, three to five times a week, and then following a consistent diet that is lower in fat and high in fiber. Um, that does not have to be a plant-based diet. It does not have to be the ketogenic diet. It has to be a diet that you're going to be consistent with that has good tasting food that is healthy for you. Um, if those measures don't get your blood pressure down into that 130s or even preferably the 120s range, then it definitely is time to talk with your physician about possibly going on some medication. And it does not mean that you have to be on that medication for life. Some patients are able to get their uh, blood pressure down with medication and after six months of therapy, uh, your doctor may be willing to give you a trial off of it to see if the changes that you've made will maintain you at that lower level. Wonderful. So with cardiovascular disease, we talked about risk factors, we've talked about signs and symptoms. If we don't adjust our risk factors and we don't pay attention to the signs and symptoms, what are some outcomes that can happen from cardiovascular disease? Um, so the, the sickening six are responsible for um, increasing the amount of um, of sclerosis or scarring, narrowing of our, our arteries. And it also increases the amount of uh, thrombus, sticky glue-like stuff that forms inside of the blood vessels. And so if your blood vessel is normally this big and then it's clogged 50% with uh, sticky substances or just the narrow uh, arteries being narrowed, then it makes it that much likelier that uh, that artery will become clogged and can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, so if you do nothing to minimize your risk and you uh, have multiple risk factors, then essentially you're, you're a heart attack or a stroke waiting to happen. That's so it, an easy fix. Um, I know stroke can be prevented 80% of the time, so I'm mm -hmm. assuming with cardiac um, and heart attack could be the same issue if we're same risk factors and we're altering those risk factors. One of the greatest lessons that I learned about the benefits of cardiovascular disease was actually while I was a resident and had a patient that came in for clearance for a surgery and was found that he had 95% occlusion of one of his arteries to his heart, but he never had any symptoms. And the reason why was because he was an avid bicycler. Now, he's not the average person. He would bike about 20 miles a week. Oh, wow. and, and, and that was on, on, on probably on a bad week. 
but what happened was that constant cardiovascular exercise caused him to build up collateral uh, blood vessels around the blockage so that his heart developed a whole nother secondary blood flow system. Wow. Um, that literally his exercise saved his life. He should have had a massive heart attack and probably would have died before getting to the hospital. But because of his active lifestyle, his body was able to make adjustments and, and compensate for the blockages that were occurring. That is how significant of an effect regular exercise has on your body. It not only decreases your risk for cardiovascular disease, it helps to regulate your appetite. It's surprising, but people who exercise more actually eat less. It uh, increases your, um, it regulates your sleep cycle so that you sleep better and respond to sleep better. When you exercise, you also release something called endorphins, which is very similar to what morphine, uh, had the effect that morphine has on your body. That's typically why uh, after you exercise, you feel really good about yourself. And once again, exercise also has been associated with increased reports of sexual satisfaction. Just for the guys out there. <laughs> um, kind of talked about your young cyclist, um, mm -hmm. very healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So is cardiovascular only for an elderly population or can it affect any genre of age? The beauty about cardiovascular exercise is that you can start at any time period. Okay. Um, while you get, uh, it's just like investing, the earlier you start, the um, more you accumulate over time. So the younger you are when you start uh, doing regular cardiovascular exercise, the more benefits you're gonna have over your lifetime. But you can start at 20, you can start at 50, you can start at 70. The uh, world record right now uh, for the oldest bodybuilder in the United States is held by a woman who I believe is in her 80s and she did not start exercising until she was 67. Wow. Uh, but she uh, holds the current world record, and I have to admit that I, I'm not too sure what my chances would be going up against her. <laughs> She's quite the heavy lifter, huh? Mm, she's doing very well. Yeah, so with the outcomes of cardiovascular disease, heart, heart attack, stroke, we know that stroke can happen in young people. We've been told that a few times. Mm -hmm. What about heart attack? Heart attack's only for old people too, right? No. No? Not at all. Okay. Um, in my work as an emergency room physician, I have to say that um, each year I've been surprised at the age of people that have been diagnosing heart attacks in. Um, I have diagnosed a heart attack in someone as young as 25. Um, and it has now become relatively common for us at least once a month to have someone come in with a heart attack in their early 30s. So I would say somewhere between 32 up to 37 there hasn't been a month where we've had at least one patient coming in that age range. And five or 10 years ago, that would have been unheard of. Sure, and it all leads back to those risk factors once again. It all leads back to the sickening six, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, lack of exercise, and persistent high levels of stress. Yes, and that happens at any age, not yeah. just at an elderly age anymore, correct? That's correct. So what are some other things you'd like to share with us about cardiovascular disease? What I'd like to share is that it's never too late to make a change. And any step that you take in the right direction is a good step. Uh, for example, um, I'd like to use myself for example. Um, I find myself in a very high stress job and before I knew it, my weight had crept up to nearly 200 pounds. Um, and over the course of the past year, actually this month makes one year that I've been working um, very consistently in the gym to lose weight and I've gone from 30% body fat down to just 10% body fat. And my initial goal was just to walk 500 steps a day. Um, so I went from being sedentary to 500 steps and gradually built that up to now where my goal is 10,000 steps. This is not something that you need to go from zero steps to 10,000. This is not something where you go from 30% body fat to 10% body fat. It's really taking one step at a time. My goal was just to live a healthier lifestyle. And each step that I took made it easier for me to take that next step. So if you're someone that's not moving, I encourage you to set a goal, 250, 500 steps a day. And once you've met that goal every day for two weeks, change it and make it a little bit harder. Go from 500 steps to 750 a day, and then to 1,000. Make it a point that you're going to eat a salad one day a week. Uh, make it a point that you're going to eliminate uh, getting fast food uh, from your diet. But make one step at a time, and once you see how you feel after making that step, I think it will encourage you to take another step and to continue to lead a healthier lifestyle. Also important to know is that parents set the tone for their children. 
So parents that live a healthy lifestyle, parents that exercise have children that are two to three times more likely to exercise in adulthood as well. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that, yes. Um, definitely kind of that trickle cycle. Um, mm -hmm. Parents who have smoked usually have children that end up smoking, kind of that full circle that kind of revolves, um, or um, high, high blood pressure, eating habits, things like that. Um, anything else you'd like to share? Um, cardiovascular risk or anything like that with us real quick before we end the episode? Remind everyone of the sickening six and remind them that it takes as little as three 10 minute increments. If you can exercise for 10 minutes three times in a day, three to five times a week, you decrease your chances by half. Um, if I were to, uh, to offer everyone 50% off at a local store, I'm pretty sure people would be jumping up for that savings. But what about decreasing your chances of having a, a sudden death by 50%? I'm hoping that a lot of people will use that coupon. Yes, definitely. Can you describe real quick before we leave um, some signs and symptoms of heart attack? We know what they are of stroke. Mm -hmm. um, could we hear a little bit about a, what a heart attack might look like and what we should do? All right. The typical symptoms that we tell people to watch for would be sudden onset of chest pain. And that chest pain uh, can be sharp, it can be dull. Uh, many times people describe it as a sensation of an elephant sitting on their chest. Sometimes that pain may radiate, uh, it may go to the left shoulder, it may go to the neck, the arm, or even the back. Uh, sometimes it can be associated with nausea and sweating. But any unexplained chest pain, we want you to come to the ER. Nine out of 10 patients that come to the ER with chest pain don't wind up having a heart attack um, and wind up having some other explanation or even some reversible cause of heart disease. But we want that. We want any person having chest pain, especially if you've never had it before, to come to the ER and be evaluated. It's also important to know that many women don't have those typical symptoms. Um, women may present with just not feeling well. They may present with vague pain in other parts of the body. Uh, so the best thing that you can do is actually to get those yearly checkups where your doctor can monitor your risk factors and help you to reduce your chances of getting to uh, having a heart attack or a stroke in the first place. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. That it concludes our episode for For the Love of You. We're so um, thankful that Dr. Montague could come and join us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you.